So, without further ado, Mike, what does make Wavertree special? Well, thanks very much, Rob. I should firstly say what an honour it is to be allowed to address some of our members from a long way away who yeah. um, I would recognise the names but wouldn't recognise the faces because um, we've been going a long time now and this every cloud has a silver lining and um, this uh, adventure into Zoom has allowed us to reach corners that uh, we've previously not been able to. Um, as for the choice of topic, you know, Rob was quite right. I, I did toy uh, with a lot of different alternative titles and ideas. Um, what I realized not that long ago was that this summer is exactly 50 years since I first, uh, not set foot, but first laid eyes on Wavertree. Um, I came on a day trip to Liverpool and uh, I'm still here. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to start sharing my screen, which will um, allow you to see some of the pictures I've put together. Right. Well, the question to be asked, I suppose, is why, after all these years, am I still involved with the Wavertree Society? As Rob says, I don't live in Wavertree anymore, haven't since 1982. But um, somehow I've um, not been able to let go. And I hope this evening to, to try and explain why that was. And I'm sure uh, <laughs> it'll resonate with, with some of the rest of you. And if at the end of the talk, I've missed out any reasons why you think Wavertree is special, by all means, add them to the, to the discussion. My original um, home was in Northwest London. And um, this Observer magazine, which is actually a picture of the Olive Mount cutting in Wavertree, is as far as I know, the first time um, I ever saw a picture of Wavertree, but I didn't know it was Wavertree, Wavertree at all. Um, it was actually published on my 17th birthday. I only know this, by the way, as a result of the wonders of Google, because uh, when I typed in, I remembered it was called The Forging of the North. I was interested in industrial archaeology and um, it made a great impact on me. So uh, at that age of 17, obviously, I was considering options. And the one thing I decided was that I, I didn't want to stay down south. I wanted to move up north. It's more interesting in the north. Um, the heart of the Industrial Re Revolution. Um, in fact, to study though, I went uh, a long way in the other direction. I went to Exeter in Devon. Mm. And um, there I, I pursued my um, interest in industrial archaeology. But I also came across this book in the university library, mm -hmm. Seaport by Quentin Hughes. Mm. It was full of really spectacular black and white photographs of Liverpool warehouses, office buildings, public buildings and housing. And this really made me determined that I wanted to see this, this wonderful place called Liverpool. So that's my um, number one, why, what makes Wavertree special. From my point of view, it's special because it's in Liverpool. And Liverpool is the city that I decided I wanted to make my home. My first glimpse of Wavertree in the summer of 1971, um, was on a, an excursion train from Harrow Station. I think it cost 30 shillings. If anyone remembers what that was, one pound 50 return. Um, and we had uh, many hours, several hours in Liverpool. And I distinctly remember the approach um, along the embankment with Wavertree Playground on the right and this um, spectacular roofscape spreading out to the left down towards the river with the tower of St Bridget's and the tower of Sefton General Hospital um, standing up above the, the, the slate roofs. So that was my first glimpse of Wavertree, but it was Liverpool I was really interested in. Of course, Wavertree, although I say uh, Wavertree is in Liverpool, it was not in Liverpool. 
uh, until Liverpool expanded to, to meet it in the, the 19th century. This is a map of 1768. This is the Yates and Perry's map, which is one of the first detailed maps to be produced of the area around uh, Liverpool and Wavertree. Uh, there's Little Liverpool down on the river and these roads radiating inland. And we can zoom in to the section covering Wavertree. There's Wavertree, Wavertree Lane, here's what's now called Picton Road and High Street. And the Wavertree consisted of a cluster of cottages up the um, what's now the High Street, around Mill Lane and along Cow Lane, which of course became Prince Alfred Road. Wavertree was in fact an independent township until 1895. Um, the boundaries were quite, uh, quite extensive. It stretched almost as far as Edge Lane in the north. It followed the present day line of Ch Queen's Drive in the east. And then it included um, what we now call Mossley Hill. And uh, the boundary went from Penny Lane down along just uh, north of Smithdown Road before um, joining the old uh, line of a brook where the brook house is today. Hmm. This is a map of 1836 showing that Wavertree was, you know, a, a, a real village, quite um, a significant settlement. The uh, road name Cow Lane, you can see, um, obviously suggesting its agricultural origins. Um, the lake is shown where the children's playground, the swing park is today uh, on the corner of Mill Lane and what's still called Lake Road. And uh, I was not particularly aware of Wavertree's history at that time. In fact, I wasn't aware at all of Wavertree's history. All I knew was that there were some good pubs there because uh, we were all young. We were all working in the what became the Merseyside Planning Department. Uh, County Council Planning Department. As Rob said, I was a statistician working on um, population trends, analysis, things like that. And uh, we were all, we were nearly all immigrants for some reason. Um, I think planners had such a bad name in Liverpool that no self-respecting Scouse youngster would want to work in planning because they reckon the planning planners had ruined the city. So the planning department of Merseyside County Council was almost entirely populated by people who'd come in from elsewhere. So we used to go exploring and uh, one of the best ways of exploring was pub crawls. And one of our favorites was Wavertree. So I used to walk across the mystery from uh, my fl the flat at the time I was living in was in Hartington Road on uh, quite near the gates of Sefton Park. So walking across to Wavertree was quite a pleasant way to spend a, a summer's evening and uh, staggering back home was, uh, was okay as well. So the pubs I remember most, the, the, the Lamb, um, with its high backed wooden seats and the big tables and the coffee house. Um, and these were certainly both uh, around in Wavertree in the, the early, very early 19th century. As um, other talks I've given over the years to, to groups around the city have tended to be, have this title, Wavertree, a village in the city, because I think that, that just about sums it up. It is within the city of Liverpool, its history reflects the history of the city of Liverpool, um, but it still has the character of a village in many ways. So that was reason number two for what makes Wavertree special. It's got its own identity. It's not just uh, an amorphous part of Liverpool. I, I was brought up in a, a, a suburb of London, which you couldn't really identify where the centre was um, or you couldn't tell what its history was. Um, Liverpool and Wavertree were quite different, full of history, full of interest. The place I moved to when I decided to Liverpool was to be my home for a long while, I decided I wanted to buy a house. Um, I was intrigued by an advert in the Echo, um, Wavertree Garden Suburb. 
Now I'd heard of Waverley Garden Suburb because it was a conservation area and I'd made it my business working in a planning department to, um, I think it was the first uh, Easter holiday, to buy a, a ticket, a weekly ticket for the buses and try and visit as many conservation areas as possible. And I do remember having visited Fieldway here um, very briefly. In 1975, um, a house was advertised for sale. I, I couldn't afford it, or I reckoned I couldn't afford it anyway. But I, out of interest, I went along to see the estate agent. Now, in those days, they proudly claimed that um, there'd never been a for sale board displayed in Fieldway. Houses were always sold by word of mouth. And um, the agent I went to, his secretary, happened to live in one of the houses along this block. So she'd asked him, uh, when her neighbour wanted to uh, sell her house, will you, um, uh, Mr. Harris, will you will you sell um, the house for my friend? And uh, I visited him and he gave me a, a lecture on the history of Waverley Garden Suburb. I subsequently yeah. discovered it was more, more or less wrong, um, <laughs> but he, he convinced me. He said the houses were designed by a German architect um, and uh, you won't find any houses better than that and uh, amazingly of course in those days you you had to um, put your name down for a mortgage and possibly if you were lucky six months nine months later you came to the top of the list and that's probably why house prices were compared with today you know relatively low but anyway I'm delaying I mean one of the things I'm notorious for is overrunning and I've deliberately promised I'm going to finish this talk in an hour so Rob better um, make faces at me if I start straying off again. Yeah. Um, Waverley Garden Suburb was already a conservation area. This was the institute, centre of the um, social events. In fact, one of our plaques put up quite recently uh, explains that, built in 19, converted from two cottages in 1912 as the social and cultural centre um, for the community. And this is how it was used in the 1930s, the Floral Queen Festival. Um, of course, Waverley Garden Suburb was pretty isolated in those days. Um, they had to uh, struggle to persuade people to go and live there. And uh, they produced this brochure in 1914 um, with scenes, you know, showing uh, what a, a picturesque area it was. Um, showing the way in which pleasant vistas are obtained at every point, says the caption. And they published a brochure um, comparing how the Wavertree Garden suburb been, had been laid out compared with the uh, traditional bylaw housing, which had been sweeping out from Liverpool towards Wavertree over the past 50 or so years. The houses were rented um, in both of these areas, but they weren't very much more in the garden suburb um, compared with the traditional terrace streets of Liverpool. Um, as I say, it was a pretty isolated area. It's the hatched area here of Thingwall, Thingwall Road. It was intended to be much larger, stretching mm. towards Broad Green Station, but all that had been built when the First World War broke out was the area west of Queen's Drive. And as it says on the map, electric trams um, from the Picton Clock Tower. So if you lived there, you were expected to walk down to the Picton Clock Tower to travel into, uh, into town. Right, well, the reason for, um, for that interlude was reason number three, what makes Wavertree special? It has a garden suburb because there's only 13 or so of these in the whole country. Garden suburbs laid out um, on what was called the co-partnership basis in before the First World War. Now, obviously I, I used to do this uh, walk down to the Picton Clock um, quite regularly. Um, I used to go down every, every, every Sunday morning, I would walk down the high street, not because I was going to church, it was because I was going to the Liver Laundrette um, my colleagues always used to tell me that was my church. Um, and of course, every couple of weeks, I would go to the Abbey Cinema to see all the films I'd missed over the past five years or so. Um, I don't remember seeing the two that were being shown on this 
occasion. Confessions of a window cleaner and confessions of a driving instructor. I think, I think they, um, they managed to pass me by. But that's all I thought Wavertree consisted of, pubs, a laundrette and a cinema. I remember having to go to, sh for going shopping, I'd go to either Old Swan or Allerton Road. A colleague of mine at work um, came up to me one day in, must have been April 1977, with a copy of this uh, A4 handbill which had been put through her letterbox. Um, she lived just off uh, Heathfield Road. The Wavertree Association inviting people to an inaugural meeting when an address illustrated by slides will be given by J.A. Moore Esquire, Wavertree, mm -hmm. then and now. Well, she knew I was interested in the history of Liverpool. Um, she knew I was interested in the history of Wavertree Garden Suburb. Um, she thought I would be interested in the history of Liverpool and how, how right, sorry, history of Wavertree and how right she was. Because these were some of the pictures that John Moore showed on that occasion. They meant nothing whatsoever to me. I didn't know where the places were, but I was absolutely intrigued. That was the old post office, it turned out, on the corner of Grove Street and High Street. This row of buildings is still there. If you picture yourself opposite the end of Sandown Lane, you might know there are two street nameplates reading High Street and Picton Road. This is the left-hand block, which is the beginning of High Street. Mm -hmm. Not a very good quality picture, but, but these were all from the collection that John Moore had assembled. This was the arch um, erected over the High Street to welcome Prince Alfred to Wavertree in 1866. This was the laying of the tram lines, the electric, when the horse trams were um, turned into electric um, traction in the 1890s. There's the Picton clock just about visible at the far end. <laughs> and this was another completely um, unknown picture to me. This was Wavertree Mill and the adjacent quarry. I had no idea what, where that was at all. In fact, by the end of the talk, I, I was beginning to wonder, was this, were these pictures of Wavertree at all? Um, this one as well, this is what John Moore called um, Wavertree's first town hall. It later became the, the presbytery of Our Lady of Good Help in um, Chestnut Grove, and now it's a, a day nursery. And then the final one I'm showing from his selection was the town hall as it was not long after it was built. Um, all of this made me realise, and I think everyone else in the room made us realise how historic a place Wavertree was. Um, I spoke to Mr Moore afterwards. Um, he told me he was a retired policeman and he was originally from Hull. And he, he commented, he, he said, it only seems to be the people who come in from outside who are interested in the history of pl the places. And I think that's the reason for that. It's not because people aren't interested, it's because um, having lived in a place, you know, all, all your life, you tend to take certain things for granted. And it's not obvious um, what of these, how many of these memories are of interest to other people. So John Moore was really my, my inspiration. He, he shared his pictures with me, he allowed me to photograph them. And in fact, I subsequently went on to give talks using the same material supplemented by um, updated pictures. So that was reason number four. Um, why, what makes Wavertree special? It's got history. It may be obvious now, but in 1977, I think it came as a surprise to, uh, to quite a few of us. And this is how the Liverpool Daily Post reported the event. A move to form another public watchdog group got up firmly off the ground last night when over a hundred people packed the Cunters Lane Congregational Church to launch the Wavertree Society. The society aims to protect the area by keeping a check on planning proposals, encouraging preservation and improving public facilities. Well, this was um, nearly um, 44 years ago, and I'm pleased to say we're still still at it. Mm. 
Um, reason number five why is Waverly special is because it's got so many listed buildings. Um, there's actually been a, a resurvey of the listed buildings in 1975, um, just two years before our society was set up, and that added a whole lot of um, additional buildings to the list. And uh, Wavertree ended up having more listed buildings than any other part of Liverpool, apart from the city centre, Walton and Gattaca. So it had obviously been recognised as an area not only of historic interest, but of architectural interest as well. Um, but of course, the centrepiece of the village, the town hall, was in this state. This picture was taken in 1979 when the city council, the owners, were proposing to spend, I think it was £130,000 on dem demolition. So that was one of the early campaigns the society launched to, to save the town hall. Other buildings that were added to the uh, list of listed buildings in 1975 were many of the terraces, terraced houses in the high street. We call them Georgian. Some of them in Wavertree are genuinely Georgian. Most of the ones in the city centre are in fact early Victorian. Um, Wavertree has a fair number of Georgian buildings. Um, Edwardian buildings as well. The public buildings that were created after 1895, when Wavertree Township was absorbed by Liverpool, the public library, the swimming baths, um, and further up the road was the old Technical Institute. They were all listed buildings, made listed buildings in 1975. And then some of the smaller houses, um, every single house in Orford Street was listed in 1975. Um, before that, it, was, it only tended to be the large mansions that had been on the list. 1952 was um, when uh, listed buildings were first created. The idea of listed buildings was created by the government. And uh, a few of them, but not that many, were in Wavertree. This is Olive Mount, the mansion, still there, but very much hidden away now, um, just off Old Mill Lane. Holy Trinity Church, that uh, certainly Nicholas Pevson regarded as one, as one of the finest churches in northwest England. That had been listed since the 1950s. The row of houses on the corner of Waterloo Street and High Street, which are today grade two starred, which is uh, one of the higher um, classifications, they were listed in the 1950s, including, of course, the bow window shop, which uh, we've put a plaque on, out of, almost out of sight, but uh, there is now a um, the text of the plaque displayed in the window for the benefit of uh, anyone who hasn't got a long neck. And um, one of the earliest publications of the society was a list of all the listed buildings and inside was some advice to owners on what they can and shouldn't do. With, uh, with listed buildings. But what we campaigned for, apart from the restoration of the town hall, our other big campaign in the early years was for Wavertree Village to be made a conservation area. So reason number five for um, what makes Wavertree special was it has a lot of listed buildings. Reason number six is it has now two conservation areas because we were successful in 1979 in having this area there's the high street there's Sandown Lane, North Drive, South Drive and um, Prince Alfred Road, Hunters Lane down towards Holy Trinity Church and the Blue Coat School all um, included within the Wavertree Village conservation area. We had great support from our local councillors, particularly Len Tyra. Um, you may remember one of our newsletters last year celebrated the um, 40th anniversary of the conservation area. And um, this uh, newspaper cutting was featured in that newsletter. Um, the council produced an advisory leaflet and we, our society was asked to deliver them door to door, which we did. 800 copies, I think it was, 800 houses and business premises. Um, 
We also um, originally paid for these green plates at the entrance to the two conservation areas, not just Wavertree Village, but not, uh, there's Victoria Park, by the way. I realized when assembling these slides, I hadn't included any photographs of one of the most attractive parts of the uh, Wavertree Village conservation area. That's North Drive. But there's what I um, thought I was coming on to, the conservation area plate for Wavertree Garden Suburb. And the boundary of that area um, included most of the houses built, laid out within the co-partnership garden suburb estate um, of 1910 to 1914. Reason number seven, what makes Wiyoti special? Stories and legends. Um, I'm not saying all of these stories are not true. Some of them undoubtedly are, but uh, for example, the Wavertree Urns, these now on display in the Museum of Liverpool, were discovered in 1867 when the foundations for this house were being built, being dug in um, North Drive, Victoria Park. And to commemorate the fact this uh, terracotta um, urn, not really anything like the shape of the ones that were discovered, uh, was in, set in the wall. And there's another one on the other side of the, it's a pair of semi-detached houses, originally called Urn Mount West and Urn Mount East. On the corner of um, North Drive and Mill Lane, of course, is the, the Monk's Well. Uh, we put a plaque up here, one of our first plaques a few years ago now, source of legend for many generations and the Latin rhyme means, he who here does not bestow, the devil laughs at him below. Um, that's what the well supposedly looked like originally. This was from an engraving of the uh, early 18th century. The same inscription, uh, clearly the arch has since been filled in and the uh, cistern, as it was called, where people could um, scoop up the water that had also been blocked off and a, a conventional pump had been substituted. But in the first guidebook of Liverpool published in 1796, visitors to Liverpool were recommended to, to ride out to, uh, to Wavertree to see the Monk's Well. <laughs> Wavertree is a pretty village, pleasantly situated. It forms an agreeable contrast to the sea prospects near Liverpool. Here is a good inn and tavern where regular assemblies are supported. A well near the pond has the following singular inscription of ancient date, which appears to have been lately renewed. And here we are, Queen on that pod habit, demon infraridit. Um, the translation was on, uh, on our plaque. But moving on to another guidebook, a more recent one, even in 1937, it seems the only features of interest in Wavertree were thought to be the Monk's Well and the fact that urns, prehistoric Bronze Age burial urns had been found um, in what they call Olive Mount, but it really meant Victoria Park. And here's their translation of the inscription, he who doth no gifts bestow, the devil laughs at him below. And of course the, the legend is that um, there were once there was once some sort of monastic house behind the monk's well and if people didn't leave a donation when they drew, drew water then they might be in trouble in the afterlife. That was one story. The other story was that there were underground passages leading from the monk's well in all directions to, uh, so it was said, Chilwall Abbey, um, so the Chilwall Priory, which never was a priory, um, when this was published in that article I showed you earlier called Village in the City, it mentioned the Wavertree Society, it mentioned my uh, telephone number as secretary of the society, <laughs> and it also mentioned the um, story of the tunnel to um, Chilwall Church. I got an irate phone call from somebody reading the article who said, here you go again, telling them all this nonsense about the secret passageway leading to Chilwall. He said, it didn't go there at all. It went to Healy's Bottling Works in Wellington Road. Um, I'm afraid I didn't believe that story either. 
the horseshoe stones in um, Chilwall Road, near the corner of Thingwall Road. You might remember in our newsletter three years ago or so now, uh, one of the stones was dislodged, not destroyed, fortunately. It was salvaged and built, rebuilt back into the wall. Um, there are two of these with four horseshoes on each, and it's said that um, this was the site of a smithy. One, that's one story. Uh, other people will tell you this is uh, where Dick Turpin um, jumped over the, uh, the stone wall to escape the authorities. Other people will say that, um, and I think this is more likely, the stones were brought from the demolished smithy, the smithy that had to be demolished on Wavertree Green um, when the uh, Enclosure Act was passed. And I'll come to that a bit later on. And other, other stories, of course, are attached to the what was called the smallest house in England. This was a postcard published in Edwardian Times. And um, there are the stories relate to how many children were raised there. I, I think the uh, the record I've heard was um, eight, was it? Or was it even? I, every time I tell the story, I used to add one on. So I suppose I created the uh, the legend in a way. Having looked at the records, I'm afraid I haven't been able to find any any records of, uh, of a large family being brought up there. And uh, we've kept an eye on it over the years. It's got one of our green plaques and um, it's now the entrance to the student housing, which is on the first floor above the cock and bottle. Another story is connected with these gates in Church Road North. The, um, outside the School for the Blind, because the School for the Blind was built in the 1890s on the site of what had been Wavertree Hall, a large mansion. And the story goes that in the middle of the 19th century, the daughter of the wealthy man who lived in Wavertree Hall eloped with the coachman through the gates. <laughs> and uh, the father was so distraught and so um, embarrassed by what had happened that he ordered the gates to be locked and um, specified that they were never again to be reopened. Um, this is the view from inside or the, when it was Wavertree Hall. Um, sadly, uh, he, it is said that it was written into the deeds, but I have looked at the deeds of the School for the Blind and I have to tell you there isn't a mention anywhere of those gates but they're quite happy to go along with the story and they allowed us to put a, a plaque up um, commemorating the, uh, the legend. So that was reason number seven. Wavertree has an awful lot of stories and legends. Reason number eight, Wavertree has also had quite a few famous residents. Now um, normally, I would ask people to put their hands up and say, who is this? But um, I do, I'm afraid I don't have that facility tonight. So I'll tell you, you're probably all telling yourself. Anyway, if I tell you the first line of one of our poems, The Boy Stood on the Burning Deck, you may know that it's Felicia Hemans, Mrs. Hemans, as she was called. She lived for a while in the high street. Uh, this was a postcard published at the beginning of this century. Um, and the caption reads 17 High Street, Wavertree, the residence of Mrs. Hemans, poetess, about 1830. She didn't in fact stay in Wavertree very long. It was, it was at the height of her fame and people apparently used to um, go through her gate and go up to her window and peer in to see what this famous person was getting up to. So um, she didn't have a very good opinion, I'm afraid, of the, the villages of Wavertree and she, she moved off to, to North Wales. Mm. This was a more recent resident, um, Sir James Picton, very influential in the life of Wavertree in the 19th century. Uh, he moved to a house which he designed and built for himself called Sandy No at the top of Mill Lane. And uh, that was in 1848. The family moved in and uh, he became one of the founder members of the Wavertree Local Board of Health, which was the body that uh, met at the town hall and which uh, sorted out any problems of Wavertree, lighting, sewerage, um, street sweeping and so on. So he was an architect by profession, an architect and surveyor. 
He was also a historian of Liverpool and uh, he became chairman of the Liverpool Libraries Committee. That's why we have the Picton Library in town. He also became chairman of the Wavertree Local Board for over 20 years. So he was very much uh, a famous personality in Liverpool and very prominent in the life of Wavertree. What he's most remembered for in Liverpool is probably the Picton Library, but in Wavertree undoubtedly he's remembered for the Picton Clock. And the Picton Clock was uh, one of his designs um, and the intention was to be a memorial to his wife. They'd been married for almost 51 years um, and James Picton thought she deserved a memorial. And I always like to tell people, I thought the, 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 the reason he was thankful to her was that he was very interested in old buildings, architecture, not just in Britain, but um, all over Europe. And every summer he would go on a, an expedition and he would sketch historic buildings and he would write postcards and letters which he would send home to his wife who stayed at home in Mill Lane with the children saying I'm having a wonderful time I've been to this place today and I'm going somewhere else tomorrow uh, I don't think well she obviously tolerated it for many many years so I, I think she really did deserve a clock <laughs> and um, 1884 it was um, unveiled or set going as the newspaper report um, described it and um, it became, of course, one of the landmarks of Wavertree. Another famous resident, more recent. Again, I would be asking you, who is this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone, yeah. someone knows, I, I would imagine. It's George Harrison, believe it or not, born in Arnold Grove, Wavertree in 1943. Um, he was only six when the family moved away to speak because um, they'd outgrown their two up, two down in Wavertree. But he remembered his early days. This book, this picture was taken from his autobiography called I, Me, Mine. And um, even today, well, every, every day, coach loads of visitors still come to Arnold Grove to um, look at the house where George Harrison was born. The coach parks in normal times, this is, um, before lockdown and so on. The Magical Mystery Tour would be operating something like seven or eight times a day, dropping off outside the cock and bottle, walking around the corner to Arnold Grove. And as you probably know in, from our newsletter, one of the things we're consulting on at the moment, or Love Wavertree are hoping to consult on at the moment, is um, how the residents of Arnold Grove regard the tourists who come every day to uh, visit the shrine where... George Harrison was born. That's a great photo there. Famous residence was reason number eight. Reason number nine, Wavertree has some very significant landmark buildings. I've already mentioned one of them, the, the Picton Clock Tower. Um, alongside it, of course, this is the most recent picture I have of the, the Abbey before the, the co-op words came down and of course it's now closed and we're awaiting to hear from Lidl as to what proposal they have for the building. Um, but both the Abbey and the Picton Clock are probably the most familiar landmarks to people from outside the area. Um, certainly when I started giving talks in the 19, uh, early 1980s, um, anywhere outside Liverpool mentioned the word Wavertree and that was the first thing people th thought of. Oh, the Picton Clock and the Abbey Cinema, because they were the, the landmarks that they um, thought of when they came out along um, Picton Road towards Chilwall. The Abbey and the Picton Clock were also well known to John Lennon. John Lennon lived for the first five years of his life just off Church Road in um, Newcastle Road, number nine Newcastle Road. And these were the draft lyrics he wrote for the song In My Life, um, recording his bus journey to school when he lived in Menlove Avenue, traveling to school at the, um, well, uh, the, the art school, I should say. And um, Penny Lane is one I'm missing, up Church Road to the clock tower, in the circle of the abbey, I have seen such happy hours. Well, they never actually made it, those words never made it onto the final version. <laughs> but um, 
those people who are campaigning for the preservation of the Abbey cinema are quoting these lyrics as one of the reasons why it's significant. Another Wavertree landmark building um, from an unusual angle. This, as you will probably recognize, the Blue Coat School and the Blue Coat Chapel. And uh, this picture was taken thanks to Heritage Open Day a few years ago. This picture was taken from the, the tower of St Barnabas Church, which uh, was open to the public. So if you ever get a chance, if we ever get back to normal and uh, Heritage Open Day uh, once again in operation, do keep a lookout for the tower tours of St Barnabas Church. The Blue Coat School moved to Wavertree in 1908 and um, the chapel was, was built. The clock tower came slightly later. Uh, in those days, of course, they regarded it as moving out into the countryside because mm -hmm. Wavertree was, was right on the edge um, of Liverpool. Finally, on the section on the landmark buildings, the lockup. Um, this was how it looked originally before 1869. The, as you, I'm sure you know, um, it was originally built primarily as a as a place to put drunks overnight. I mean, it wasn't just myself and my colleagues who got drunk in Wavertree mm -hmm. in the 19. Um, 70s it was uh, people getting drunk in the 1790s and uh, they decided that it would be a lot cheaper to build a lockup than to pay the constable the village constable so much a night for board and lodging of prisoners so the lockup was built um, and we still open it to visitors in, when normal times return Wavertree Green, um, I mentioned before, it was the open space that had to be left under the terms of the Wavertree Enclosure Act. And the reason for that was the existence of a windmill just off Beverly Road. That was the windmill um, shown on John Moore's photograph. It took me um, quite a time to um, discover the, the, the exact site of that, that mill. There's very little, very little to see now, but uh, this area between the lake, the lockup as uh, was later built, and um, between Lance Lane, Church Road North, as it is today, and Walton Road, was Wavertree Green. An open space depicted in the early 20th century by uh, Mr. Beatty, who produced a whole series of um, of paintings of the villages around Liverpool. There's the windmill in a derelict state. There's the houses of Brereton Avenue and uh, fronting onto um, Church Road North here. And of course, that is one of our green spaces that has survived. It's now the playing fields for the Blue Coat School. Hmm. Originally, Wavertree was, the village of Wavertree was more or less surrounded by green spaces. That's reason number 10, by the way, what makes Wavertree special. All the green spaces. The grounds of Olive Mount, the mansion, which I showed a picture of before, extended right down to Thingwall Road. And uh, part of the parts of them still survives. It was until quite a few years ago now, the Manweb Sports Club, um, as you will know from our newsletters, now in private hands, um, an owner in the Isle of Man who apparently is notorious for neglecting property in the hope that uh, one day permission will be given for development or resale. So um, we're keeping our fingers crossed. We're trying to get the council to rescind the lease because the lease says quite definitely this land is to be for sports club purposes only. And um, it remains to be seen what will happen. But th this is one of the surviving green spaces that used to ring the village of Wavertree. Another one um, was the grounds of this house. The house is gone. We haven't got a photograph of it. This was a house called Wavertree Grange and it was stood in 
what was originally Kowloon. Mm. And it was the grounds of the Grange that became Wavertree Playground in 1895. The house was demolished, but uh, the whole estate, it was announced, was purchased by an anonymous individual and presented to the city of Liverpool with the suggestion that it should be used for recreation. Um, and in the first instance, the donor laid it out with a series of sports pitches and so on. It was meant to be for pre predominantly children's recreation. It wasn't to be a park. It wasn't to be another Sefton Park or another um, Prince's Park, mm. Stanley Park. It was to be um, an antidote, really, to the um, dense bylaw housing, as it was called, which had spread out of Liverpool between Picton and Smithdown Roads. So they were the, the, the mystery and Wavertree Green and what we still call the Manweb playing fields are the three survivors of these um, open spaces which originally ringed the village. There have been new green spaces created though. I mean, we, we lost the grounds of Sandown Hall, um, but thanks to the efforts of the society, um, mm. We've created, we created a rose garden. This was the high street in 1979. And uh, we were fortunate enough to win a competition. Uh, Merseyside improved houses as they were then the housing association gave us the money. Um, and the result was the rose garden as you see it today. But um, I say the society is, has the credit. It, was really Joyce and John Edwards. Joyce Edwards was chair of the society for a long while and uh, she and her husband John took it upon themselves to look after the Rose Garden as they still do. And a plaque is still there um, recording the fact that it was the Wavertree Society that um, was responsible for its creation. So well, in a sense, they, they are all the reasons, 10 reasons um, why Wavertree is special. It's in Liverpool, um, it's, but it's got its own identity. It's got a garden suburb. It's got plenty of history. It's got a lot of listed buildings. It's got two conservation areas. It's got a multitude of stories and legends. It's got famous residents. It's got quite a few landmark buildings, and it's still got green spaces. Um, as I say, if you've got any more to add to that list, I'll be very pleased to hear them. The other thing it's got is, I would, I would say, um, local pride. And that was one of the main reasons why the society was founded. Um, Wavertree was not, um, in the 1970s, a place people boasted about. In fact, when I moved into Fieldway in Wavertree Garden Suburb, the residents there insisted it wasn't Wavertree, it was Chilwall. And um, I think the same applied to uh, a lot of the other parts of uh, what was historically part of the township of Wavertree. But we do, did, our, did our best to you know, raise the profile of the, the place. The Lord Mayor was invited to visit in 1980, and that was uh, provided the incentive for the owner of the, what we, I still tend to call the cobbler's shop, the 102 High Street. Um, this man was employed to come and uh, repair the, the windows. Um, we started, I started doing guided walks. You can see me in my younger days. Um, I'm not sure what we were all looking at. I presume it was the Picton Glock. <laughs> I don't know whether any, any of you recognize yourself there. This picture was taken, I think, in 1987. The wakes there. Uh, the Wakes Fair banner, I've only just noticed it. 1984, um, our committee um, celebrated the centenary of the Picton clock. Um, funny how our committee uh, used to be young and we're now all old. I wonder why that is. Mm. <laughs> um, 1999, we published, it had taken um, 20 years to produce, but so uh, finally, I put the finishing touches to discovering historic Wavertree and the Echo gave us quite a nice um, review. Um, 
city, the city's secret corner. So uh, even in 1999, you know, there were people like me living in Liverpool who had uh, were unaware of Waver Tree. The Wakes Fair um, is an old tradition. The Waver Tree Wakes, we came across uh, a, a newspaper article from the 1880s about all the riotous behaviour and drunkenness that went on uh, in Waver Tree during Wakes Week. And uh, we decided to recreate it, but, but as we said at the time, uh, without the alcohol. So we took over the swing park um, and uh, put on a range of entertainments. We got the, the girls from the Elliot Clark School of Dance to come and uh, revive the tradition of Maypole dancing. I don't know whether any of you remember those. We had a whole series, um, Robert and John, Robert and John Wood is uh, still on our committee and they were the driving forces behind the, the Wakes Fair. Um, I mentioned before Heritage Open Day, I showed a picture of uh, Heritage Open Day at the lockup. Well, the first one of those was in 1994, um, where Mersey Mart reported that the uh, Wavertree Society um, thought that the lockup needs attention. Well, we still think it needs attention. The building has actually been remedied. What's happened since 1994 is the trees have almost completely surrounded the lockup and it's almost invisible for a large part of the year. So we're, we're hoping to get something done about that uh, in the next few months, subject, of course, to public consultation. Um, Heritage Open Day until 2020, when everything ground to a halt, Heritage Open Day has gone from strength to strength. And in 2019, we had open simultaneously six different venues, not all organized by the society. We still kept our presence at the lockup, but um, the congregation of St. Mary's Church opened uh, their premises, the Congregational Church, Holy Trinity Church, St. Barnabas Church, and the Blue Coat School, all open to visitors at the same time. And, and we coordinated the events and um, tried to um, advertise them. Mm. Um, other efforts that the society has made over the years, this was um, a clean up in the 1980s. I remember, um, I think it was 35 bin bags we managed to uh, fill in the space of a few hours. Now that's still going on, but the baton has been taken on by Love Waver Tree because many of the practical, I don't know whether it's we're getting long in the tooth or what, or whether it's just that young people um, think of the Wavertree Society as um, for old fogies rather than uh, for people like themselves. But Love Wavertree has been a real boost for Wavertree and uh, their shop now on the corner of Sandown Lane, the community hub, is, has been the centre for a whole range of community activities and long may that continue. So I've actually managed to do it in yeah. an hour, which yeah. I've amazed myself there. Um, <laughs> Sub Umbrella Foresco, the, the slogan, the motto that's displayed proudly over the town hall. I like to think it means, it, it means um, I flourish in the shade. I like to think it's little Wavertree, little village of Wavertree was proud to flourish in the shade of Big Brother Liverpool just down the road. Um, We've adopted that as our logo as well. It was designed by James Picton when he was chairman of the local board of health. And uh, of course, you are already mem ready members of the society. There's not much point in uh, advertising our membership, but if you have any friends who are not members and therefore weren't able to attend the meeting tonight, please recommend they visit our website at wavertreesociety.org or follow us on Facebook or Twitter at Wavsock and um, advise them to buy our book of uh, 200 images of old Waver Tree. Thank you very much indeed. Well, and, um, I'll now switch off my screen saving and I'll, I'll actually be able to see you. Thanks a lot. No, thank you. Uh, I, I, if, if there was a way of digit, I think you'd be all, with it. even if we can't hear you, we can. We've got, we've got digital uh, applause, Mike. Uh, um, Thank you very much. Again, well deserved. <laughs> I can it. certainly see the applause. Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Absolutely, <laughs> even at the back of the room.